Hi, and we are live. I'm Karen Holst, and I'm here with Douglas Ferguson. We're authors of Start Within, and today we have such an incredible guest, Andre Brock. He is an associate professor of media studies at Georgia Tech, and his scholarship examines the racial representations in social media, video games, black women and web blogs, whiteness, and technoculture. He has published innovative and groundbreaking research on black Twitter and on digital research methods. His first book titled Distributed Blackness, African-American Cybercultures uh, was published with the NYU Press in 2020, and it theorizes black everyday lives uh, mediated by networked technologies. And so all of that was a big mouthful of like very thoughtful work that has gone into something that is so deep and heavy and you know you've put decades of of research into this and you know the moment that we're in i i reached out to you earlier um after seeing you quoted and talking through a cnn piece around the karen meme and uh my name is karen i hold yeah. the traits of karen yeah. <laughs> and so uh you know when i read that piece i was just humbled and uh understanding more of the history of a meme and kind of how it, it then helped me navigate more exploration and, and what it means to be white and how to be an ally in this moment. So I can, I would just love to give you a moment to chat, to chat on that. Um, so Karen and it's more most recent manifestation is a description uh, of white womanhood uh, trying to exercise a power uh, role in any particular situation, often usually the most banal and mundane of situations. So uh, there was recently an incident where a white woman was walking her dog and, and a black man asked her to uh, put her dog on a leash and she threatened to call the police on him because he was African-American, right? And so it's this exercise of power in a vicious fashion, uh, particularly given what's going on uh, with the protests around George Floyd, it's not hard to understand that calling the police on black people can end up being a really fraught moment, right? But they're, they are up, what these white women are uh, apt to and often um, rely upon the presence of state violence in order to control a situation where they think their resources are being threatened. Right, I've seen uh, manifestations of this uh, in places like Starbucks, which I frequent, where uh, uh, women have, have threatened to call the police and the barista for not making their latte hot enough, for example. Right, So just little stuff. Uh, the reason why it became linked to the name Karen, uh, at least for this recent one, uh, there's been a meme over the last few years about a white woman named Karen. Uh, I uh, attributed to a number of sources. One of them was Dane Cook's comedy bit back in the mid 2000s about Karen being a douchebag. Uh, sorry, Karen. <laughs> uh, but there's, uh, and so that's the most recent, uh, well, not the most recent, that's one of the commonly acknowledged uh, start points for this particular name being linked to it, right? But as we've gotten into the social media era, there was a pushback recently by white women who felt that the name Karen was somehow uh, misogynist, right? By identifying uh, white women by this particular name. And apparently Karen is a fairly common name among a certain age of women. Um, they felt that, they, that people were being misogynist and being um, disrespectful towards them, right? And so... And in some ways it fits into a longer narrative about uh, uh, colorblind ideology where people feel that if they, their racist actions are identified by others, that makes the other people racist, not them, right? <laughs> but there's also this other mode where the privilege and, um, and I hate using that word, so I'll come back to that in a minute, but the resources and uh, entitlements that are accorded to white womanhood in Western American and, and American society, these women feel like they're under threat and they will do whatever they can to protect them. And that has been manifest in online spaces uh, through that particular uh, clapback uh, by white women to say things are this is misogynist. Uh, I follow black Twitter. Uh, and so black Twitter took the, um, expected a uh, humorous cultural critique, a dark humor, and said, well, if that's how you feel, we'll never use the K word again. All my Ks, you guys just have to fall back because we don't want you to want to disrespect you. And, and so that's where this meme really came to my attention because I studied black Twitter and that, that aspect of flipping the script, right? Instead of saying you can't use the N word anymore, you start saying you can't use the K word anymore, uh, changing Tupac lyrics to 
uh, uh, using uh, cut and replace to replace all the uses of the N word with the K word, right? And so these types of things to make fun of this idea that somehow white womanhood is under threat simply by people recognizing when they're out of order. Uh, so that's just a little bit. I'm sorry. I know we don't have a lot of time. No, uh, I, I just want to say my name is Karen. I don't like the memes. It has not kept me from marrying the person I love. It has not kept me from societal benefits. I am, it is, it is not the same. Yeah. And um, I, I just really appreciate your perspective on that. My step, my mother-in-law is named Karen. Uh, she's black, uh, but she said, given how things are going, she's decided to become an Asian Karen because they seem to be getting away with a lot more these days. <laughs> <laughs> love it. I love it. Yeah. Tell me more. We, we talked a little bit before we went live about white privilege and I was sharing, um, you know, that I grew up in South Texas. I went to the university of Texas at Austin and in university I had later in life at, you know, very formative years, my first experience in recognizing my white privilege, I took, uh, I signed up for a 101 rhetoric class in a large university like that. They place you in a, you know, different topics and I, you know, that spits out my courses and it's, you know, rhetoric of rap. I'm like, mm. wow. Yeah. I want to take that class. I, I love rap music and this, this is going to be really great. And man, was I schooled by a professor who really changed my viewpoint on who I thought I was and, um, you know, mistakes that I was making and, you know, needed to be schooled on. Uh, and I, I would imagine she had a lot of students like me that came in there and she really made an impact in my life and has come to the, to my heart today and what we're facing and like reevaluating those, those same feelings for me. But when I mentioned that to you, you would, you would kind of knee jerk reaction to the word privilege. I, I want to talk more about that. So I find um, that it's difficult to uh, break free of the connotations of privilege in part because of the beliefs that Americans hold about themselves and this meritocracy that we live in, right? And so um, I try to step away from that word um, more so to focus on um, uh, intersectionality to pull out a, a right wing uh, talk word, but intersectionality in the I, in the concept that yes, your parents you know did work hard to give you the life that you that you have in your suburb with their six figure incomes, but that means again you have resources and entitlements that you expect to fall back on. They're not privileges per se; they're more permissions, right, than anything else. And so uh, trying to do that helps me work around that really strong response because many American kids, I've taught Iowa farm kids. I've taught kids from both coasts down here. You know, the Southern um, uh, middle-class perception of itself is very different from other parts of the country, right? But they all uh, kind of tense up when I say privilege. And so trying to decontextualize that, trying to decenter the idea that they have privilege allows me to open up a concept, uh, a conversation where we can talk about, well, if you may not have privilege, what are the things that you have that you are able to identify that other people don't, right? And from that point, we can start a different conversation. And I will say it's easier to do it if we start from gender than if we start from race. So that's the other part about your anecdote that really kind of struck me is that um, race is a difficult thing to talk about. And in many cases, many folk encounter race through the prism of hip hop, right? And so my students love uh, uh, extent triple extentation and all these other new age rappers and they feel how they're so revolutionary and and but they don't really connect with them on any part other than a love for the music and the rebellion that they feel but can't express right and so trying to get a move from the aesthetics of rap or the rhetoric of rap to the realities of understanding rap in the current social historical moment is a task but it's a task that I like taking on Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I think what I, in, in those, one of the things that we talked about in the class was we were going to do a thesis around, you know, pick an artist and write about their album. And, um, you know, one of the artists that I had listed was the Beastie Boys. And my professor was like, hell no, you're not writing about the Beastie Boys in a rhetoric of, I'm like, well, the Beastie Boys well, are crucial. This, this was, <laughs> but this was an opportunity for me to explore. A, you know, like something other than what I related to. And mm -hmm. I really, I remember feeling that like embarrassment, you know, of even coming up with that. But then, in, you know, now with maturity and retrospective, you know, thinking, of course, 
that was a group that I drew to. That's who I listened to and I related to more. And then when she called me out and put me in a more uncomfortable place and made me think about things in a different way. So I, it would have been easy for me to have written about that. And it was much harder for me to find a different type of artist that I didn't relate to and write about that. So I, mm -hmm. I think that was, that was the right call on her part. Okay. Yeah. So as, as you think about this moment that we're in and how technology has the opportunity to have a positive effect, um, mm -hmm. I, oh, certainly we've seen negative, right? There's lots of right. examples of misinformation and, and abusing hashtags. Um, I'd like to start on the, you know, the positive side of, you know, like how can we help support technology in this moment and making sure that we're, we're being progressive? Uh, that's a good point. Um, I'm teaching Ruha Benjamin's Race After Technology this summer. And one of the things she talks about is that uh, private institutions and the state have really come to over rely on sorting algorithms that uh, make decisions for them. I think Amazon had a moment where they tested out a hiring algorithm only to find that it tended to prefer white men who played lacrosse named Jared over any other candidate, right? And they couldn't really understand why that was. <laughs> um, uh, and so I go back to that example because even if the algorithm does suggest that there are certain decisions that should be made. I push back and say, there's always that human factor involved. And this is really where, where algorithms encode certain beliefs. The human layer that the three of us represent also represents a moment where we can break the chain of supposition that that algorithm has and encode it and, and add a layer of moral and ethical values. Uh, recently I was um, denied uh, uh, an application to an apartment that I was looking in here in Midtown Atlanta. And they're like, well, you know, you, the, the third party service that we use says no. I said, well, can you appeal it? She's like, well, no, uh, we can only go by what it says. And so I had to make an appeal uh, basically saying, you know, I'm a professor. Strange how that works. My wife is a nurse. Uh, we can afford this apartment. It's actually cheaper where we live. So I'm asking you to, uh, to I'm appealing to you as a human being to understand that this is a place that we would like to live to continue, you know, having a good quality of life. And she, she caved, caved is not the right word. She acquiesced, right? But it's important to realize that there are moments where we can push back on algorithms. We are not duty bound uh, it may inquire, it may require a little bit more work, which is the thing about doing social justice work. It requires that you step away from the complacency that algorithms offer to actually in, in, include your moralistic perspective and not in a bad way, but your moral understanding of human agency and heterogeneity in order to make the system work equitably, right? That's the thing I would love to, for your audience to take away from this, that you do have a moment in many cases where you can intervene and add that additional human layer to computation and make it in a way such that people who would normally fall, uh, get unconsidered or not considered at all or deprecated, right? Suddenly can regain their agency through your own actions. So Andre, I, I have a question, and this is something I've personally been struggling with a, with a lot, which is, you know, I, I see, I see a lot of people taking to the streets. I see a lot of behaviors that are misunderstood. It, it's even hard to track actually what's happening because, uh -huh. you know, there's there's reports of people potentially even being instructed to, to, to institute violence, to be, just be disruptive. And it's, and it's in this day and age talking about the algorithms, it's hard to even know how to make sense of any of that. So knowing that that's difficult and, and, and how do we even tease that apart? What's your recommendation? Or what can you offer folks as far as like, what, what I, I don't feel, I don't personally feel, and you may disagree with me. I don't feel that running out to the streets is going to solve anything. I think that creates a, a lot of attention and noise, but um, like, what can we do? Uh, what conversations should we be having? What, where are the pillars of support that we might be able to, to, to make and to have real change? I'm, I'm just curious where your thoughts are at because I'm personally searching and looking and I, I'm, I'm hoping that I discover something before November rolls around, but, but uh, I would love, love to hear your thoughts on that. So the riots are important and Karen and I talked about this briefly and that they rupture our infrastructure. Right. Mm -hmm. The ways that we carry out our everyday lives, which often don't require uh, or uh, allow reflection upon the things that happen to people who are not us. The riots have really brought to attention that many people are having problems with the way society is currently constructed. Right. Uh, when in my class, 
Um, my students ask, often ask me from day one to the last day of the semester, how can we solve racism? And racism is not a problem to be solved, not by any of us. Not, if anything, it's a long, slow march right through the years, through the decades to try to address the problems that racism has encountered. But it's almost the same as trying to encourage a fish to breathe above water. <laughs> right. It's an evolutionary moment. It's not a quick change moment. And in many cases, the progress that's made by people pushing for social justice or anti-racism can get rolled back. We saw that with the Trump administration mm -hmm. and how they immediately began rolling back all the things that the Obama administration put through, not because they were bad regulations, but because Trump has a problem with Obama. Right. And so I say this to say, instead of understanding racism as a problem, I encourage my students to think of it as a problematic. Right. And the difference between the two is that a problematic is how you constitute something so that you can ask questions of it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the while rioting may not solve something, asking why these people are rioting brings you a different understanding of what they're going through and what they're interested in. Right. Similarly for technology. And in many cases, people like us are asked to come up with quick technical fixes for social problems. And the the more important thing than a technical fix is asking why technology is the space you turn to to fix these problems in the first place. And that's something that I really work hard on, on trying to educate my students at Georgia Tech and at Michigan before this, many of whom go on to corporate positions where they're coding or being engineers or the like, right? To ask why this particular strategy, what do you gain from this strategy? What, and more importantly, what are the beliefs encoded in this strategy? Right. And, and doing so gives you it may not necessarily endear you to your colleagues because many of your colleagues want the next code review to go smoothly and they don't want you to ask the moral questions. Right. Or they may want to say, well, marketing and, you know, and the uh, VCs want us to do it this way. So why should we try to buck them? Because they're the ones putting money in our pockets. But being able and interested in asking those questions is a necessary step for any kind of social change. Does that make sense? Um, and so uh, it's interesting, too, because LinkedIn just had a moment where they were asking their their uh, employees over a group wide blue jeans meeting to talk about what exactly these riots mean for a space like LinkedIn, which is kind of sort of a social media space, but very much also a professional networking space. And many of the employees, apparently, according to reports, were pushing back, saying they didn't understand why black people didn't just kind of suck it up. And I'm sorry, my dog has found someone worthy of, of insult. Cooper, come here, puppy. Come here. <laughs> come here. It's okay. Hi. Hi. Okay. Um, so, uh, and LinkedIn employees, and I didn't understand how much of a global population they are, uh, really kind of had problems because they believe that black people were kind of responsible for their own problems they experienced through structural discrimination. And I find this to be a common attitude in technology organizations. Many of the employees are, come from certain backgrounds or are rec recruited for certain things, uh, uh, technical intelligence, uh, genius, but not necessarily social and emotional uh, mm. considerations, right? And so they find it hard to believe from a rational objective basis that black people didn't bring their troubles on themselves, right? And I can't fix that. What I can do though, is encourage them to say, okay, while black people may have a specific problem, what is it that you're bringing to this situation that encourages you to think in this way? Be reflective upon your own placements, your own entitlements, the own things and you, you have in your environment, which allow you to live the way you live. And then ask, why is it that certain groups do not have the same access? It's certainly not an accident of birth, right? I mean, it kind of is, but it's certainly not any uh, inherent deviance or the like. Uh, it's something that we should consider as people who incorporate technical solutions and infrastructures. It's something that we should consider as these things are built out. Sorry about the dog interruption. <laughs> That's not good. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I we're wrapping up our time here, but one thing that I've been doing personally is and we talk about it and start within it's, it's the five layers of assumptions and how those get in the way of an idea of doing work within an organization. So if you're thinking about, you know, change in general, you know, who you are and at the core, you're not going to be able to uncover every assumption, every, every bias and accepting that, but still trying to move forward. You know, one of the things I'm doing is talking about my layers with people coming from different backgrounds. So I'm not sitting around and talking about it with my friends that I grew up with, I'm, I'm reaching out to people like you, Andre, to, to like really shake me to the core and my belief system to understand where there are hidden biases, where there's not so hidden biases 
and how to continue to move forward. And by addressing myself and then peeling the onion and going, you know, from the, that inside bullseye out, you know, the people that I surround myself by, the organizations that I give my time to, you know, the global, every, everything, all the different layers of assumptions that that's part of the work I need to do personally um, is, is work on myself first and mm -hmm. then figure out how I can, you know, bring others along. All right. That's a, that's a really good way to put it. Um, I think how, how can people find your book, your work, keep track of what you're doing? Um, I uh, sent you a link to my book, which is available in open access on the nyupress.org NYU Press site. Uh, feel free to read it and fall asleep to it. Uh, <laughs> I write I write heavily about uh, Black Twitter, which a lot of people are not as familiar with as I would wish. But I started black, to, to look in Black Twitter because I, um, my degree is in social informatics, which studies the integration of computers in organizations. And it became interesting because it's social informatics, not cultural informatics. So at worst, they were concerned with the which level of employee was incorporated with which technology. And to that, I began to be curious about what would it mean if gender was incorporated? So if you look at the movie Hidden Figures, right, it makes a difference all of a sudden if you realize that black women were the coders and mathematicians behind the Apollo space launch. It suddenly changes both the idea of diversity, right, because that diversity wasn't apparent before. It, it, before that, it looked like this monastic cult of Aryan Christian, you know, following Warner von Braun and the like, Aryan Christian rocket scientists. But suddenly you realize these women had an integral role, right? And that, that perspective is available once you begin to interrogate what role culture has in forming the tech organizations that we have. And my book is a way to try to address that from a Black perspective, but I think it's also possible to apply that to White, white perspective as well. I think whiteness is really fascinating. Well, it is fascinating to me because in so many cases it's uninterrogated, right? It's never questioned as to why it's the norm or even and uh, or even why certain aspects of whiteness are the norm. And I'll close with this because I know I tend to run at the mouth, but there was a website in the mid 2000s called Stuff White People Like. I don't know if you guys remember that, right? And it was uh, founded by a guy who was a former PhD student in Bloomington, Indiana, the Midwest of the Midwest. Right. And uh, one of the articles that I wrote about was a 63 word blog post about Obama and how certain white people liked him. And uh, at the time I started studying it in 2012, the article was written in 2008. In 2012, it had 13,000 comments. When I looked at it again, uh, my browser had trouble loading it because it had grown to 27,000 comments in 2019. Right. And in those comments are white people saying, I'm not that kind of white person. That's a particular kind of white person in the Midwest. My Philly whiteness, my Staten Island whiteness, my California whiteness, my Texas whiteness is all very different, right? But I think that that's something that is not immediately evident from the ways that whiteness is portrayed in media or on the internet. And it's really fascinating to start thinking through what your positionality as a white person, right, may bring to the technologies that you use. And so it's my hope that my book can try to get people, jolt people into understanding and being reflexive about their own positionality with respect to technology. I love it. I will share the link. That's great. I will share the link both in the notes section here, but also just separately. I think this is really important work. I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us Thanks and talk about me. it. Thanks for having me. I would love to have you guys come talk to my class if that's sometime something you guys would be interested in and available wow. for. Uh, because my students are really hungry for more industry perspectives, right? Because they feel like I'm in the ivory tower and I don't really know what I'm talking about. I'm like, but I work for Microsoft. I have the, they don't care. I don't know, uh, Andre, so you know what you're talking about. I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you I, I had trouble a asking questions because I was just like soaking it all in. It's amazing. I, I appreciate that. But, uh, but yeah, if you guys are interested, I would love to have you guys come talk to my class virtually, of course. Yes. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your time. And to everyone that's tuning in, I will share the link there. Our book is Start Within. You can find that on Amazon. And we want to continue to have these kinds of conversations. So if there's change or ideas that you're trying to launch within your company or organization, if you're looking at this moment that we're in and feeling, uh, you know, you want to know how to move forward, that's what we're talking about. So reach out to us. We would love to have people that are thinking about this type of work as guests or to continue to help us think about what topics are helpful. So thank you again. Bye-bye. Can I act normal now? <laughs>